E a mega anti-authority me. Here's a picture of me giving you the V's while not cleaning my bedroom. Rage against the machine. But while I absolutely will not do what you tell me, F you I won't do what you tell me. Wrestling, and especially WWE, bloody love an authority figure. Makes sense, someone to make all the matches, a deus ex wrestler to add a spice of justice or injustice to proceedings, fire people, and generally make some sort of logical narrative sense out of the increasingly bizarre idea that the events of a weekly wrestling show all take place in the functional kayfabe world of business, business, numbers, numbers. Most authority figures have been fairly terrible. Honestly, I'm not actually sure I remember a single thing I did did as GM for WCPW, but shut up, we're not talking about me. I'm Adam Hailing from Parts Fun Known, and here are my precious opinions about the 10 greatest authority figures in wrestling history. Also, if you'd like to see another video that we've done on Parts Fun Known about authority figures, we did a 10 worst ones. I'd probably get a bit angrier in that one. Angrier. Number 10, Teddy Long. I better make this quick before Teddy makes me go one-on-one -on -one with The Undertaker. Calling Teddy Long good is like calling milk good. It's not making anyone's top three of anything, but when it comes time for a nice cup of tea, you're certainly happy to have it than not. Especially if you're Ollie, who likes his tea like he likes his women, bone white and with a Tory name. Teddy Long was reliable. He'd turn up, call people player, do a little dance occasionally, and more than occasionally, make a tag team match. Oh, and that time he got married before doing the worst act of a heart attack this side of Doogie Howser MD. He's no one's favorite, but he certainly wasn't bad. He was an affable, if slightly unconvincing presence that made you feel like things were gonna be okay if he was around like Luke. Number nine, Vicky Guerrero. Sort of the anti-Teddy Long, really, where Big Ted was a laid-back sort whose favorite things were keeping it breezy and occasionally being gassed by The Undertaker. Vicky's passions included marrying Edge, screeching at the top of her f***ing lungs, Edge and divorcing Edge. Like Teddy Long, Vicky Guerrero never quite convinced you she was an actual person, with stunted line delivery, only two faces, happy or enraged, and the worst voice in the history of diphthongs. But again, there's a real reliable charm there. Sure, WWE's treatment of Vicky Guerrero often veered into the uncomfortably mean hog pen match. We get it, but for the most part, it seemed like she was in on the joke. And goddamn it, the pop when she appeared in the 2018 Women's Royal Rumble is proof positive that someone out there liked her shtick. Me, I, I liked her shtick. Number eight, Adam Pacitti. Now for real though, he was bloody great. Please don't use this as a jumping off point to badger both sides into working together again. We're both cool and happy where we are. It is honestly all good and thanks very much. But genuinely, I'd be remiss if I didn't put Pachiti's run as WCPW GM on this list because he was funny as balls. From the first show where he got sparked out by Big Damo, legitimately taking a punch so hard it broke his glasses, to his heel turn on Martin Kirby, the glow sticks raining down on him, to giving the fans 30 seconds to shout at him before loving him again, having Bully Ray in Pachiti Club and posing with him with that face. Honestly, he cracked all of us up every single week. Legitimately a huge amount of fun to see that whole character come together with each show that we did. Number seven, Paul Heyman. Hey, you know what's nice? Giving a role that requires someone to be talking on TV a lot to someone who's good at talking on TV. And Paul Heyman might just be the best at talking. While his role as SmackDown general manager wasn't a long one, he only lasted about six months before he was replaced by Kurt Angle, who was also pretty good. He made his mark as the sleaziest casino boss looking mother who also happened to preside over one of the greatest runs in SmackDown history with him at the wheel during the rise of Eddie Guerrero to WWE Champion. There was also a segment where John Cena made him eat soap, but maybe it's better if we don't remember that bit. In terms of charismatic arseholes, there are a few that hold your attention quite like Paul Lee, even if his time in charge was teeny tiny. Number six, Jack Tunney. Say what you want about Jack Tunney, the stone-faced, anti-charismatic Canadian promoter who was hired by Vince to be the fake president of the WWF during the Hulkamania era, but he felt real. I mean, the guy certainly wasn't an actor, which made his rare appearances on WWF television feel like you were actually seeing a businessman rather than a TV personality. His sheer mundanity was more convincing than a million characters phrases and sharp suits. And back in the day, WWF understood the principle that the less you see Jack Tunney, the more powerful his appearances would be. Unlike Stephanie McMahon, who for a few years couldn't be dragged off f***ing camera, Tunney remained in an office somewhere, only stepping onto camera when really hit the fan and a title needed vacating, or worse, deeply boring, but somehow very effective, like a big drill. 
Number five, Daniel Bryan. Speaking of woodworking tools, let's talk about the world's happiest lumberjack and the brief two-year period when someone put his matcha coconut milk latte drinking ass in charge of SmackDown during Shane's phase of looking like one of Jeremy Clarkson's unimpressive friends. I love Daniel Bryan's GM run because throughout almost all of it, he was beyond giving a f what were WWE going to do? Fire him and let him go actually wrestle? Whether it was in scripted promos, backstage segments, or best yet on Talking Smack, Brian always seemed to be in on a private joke, dicking around with that grin on his face with his mate, providing a touch of anarchic silliness to what's often a lifeless role. Designed only for matchmaking and pay-per-view selling, Daniel Bryan was wonderful. Number four, Commissioner Foley. Bloody love the commish. After months and months of Mr. McMahon or the mcmahon Helmsley regime being in charge, it was so lovely to have affable goof Mick Foley running the show for the better part of 2000. The whole run was just so intensely charming. Him not having an office, his cheap pops, him constantly busting Edge and Christian's balls, him finally getting the rock with, it doesn't matter how it makes you feel. Mick Foley is one of history's most delightful people and having him as history's most delightful commissioner gave WWF in the year 2000 this genial cohesiveness and underlying good nature which the product so often lacks. He may have only been around for six months from June to December, but he made a huge amount of fun memories and was a big part of why 2000 remains WWE's best created year. It's just a shame that when, 16 years later, WWE brought him back for Raw, they had to saddle him with Stephanie, one of history's least delightful people. I've done a lot of bagging on Stephanie on this list, haven't I? I feel bad. I'm sure she's, I'm sure she's absolutely fine. But I always oh, oh, was an authority figure, though. Goodness me. Number three, Eric Bischoff. I mean, I dyed my hair white to get your attention. What more do I have to do, Dad? In WCW, Eric Bischoff was a self-aware, pompous ass who people mostly wanted to go away. Him and his horde of sweat and cigarette smoke selling grunge-ass biker boys. In WWE, though, he was a marvelous foil, still self-aware and pompous, but constantly eating shit in the most spectacular of ways, either Steve Austin straight merging him at No Way Out 2003, being the Rattlesnake's co-GM, taking a stink face from a cliche and drag who he originally hired to perform hot lesbian action with Stephanie McMahon, oh ruthless aggression era, or the whole trial of Eric Bischoff of being carted away in a trash compactor, the innovator of Raw Roulette, the World Heavyweight Championship and the Elimination Chamber oversaw a huge amount of wonderful raw moments during his three years in charge, even though most of them were at his expense. Also, he has wrestling's second best grin after this guy right here. Number two, Mr. McMahon. For all of the downs, and there are a lot of downs, just lots of downs, there are also some of the more crucial ups in the history of professional wrestling. The character of Mr. McMahon presided over the WWF during the period where it finally pulled away from WCW and it was largely off the back of his creation, or should we say refining, of the role of dickhead authority figure, finally pushing himself and all of his swaggering bollocks front and center as a unique heat magnet following the departure of Bret Hart from his company and peacocking his way into being the perfect entitled authority figure to repeatedly come a cropper at the hands of lightning hot anti-authority figure Steve Austin. Also, even though he absolutely beat the horse to death and then kicked it in the kidneys for good measure in terms of his own exposure on the product, there can be no denying that in his prime, Vince McMahon was one of the best promos in the entire company, and few men have been at the center of so many iconic and demented wrestling moments as the chairman of the board. And number one, William Regal. The only man on the list to do it twice and for both runs to have been good. More often than not, a wrestling authority figure has a position of power but can never dream of being a physical threat to the wrestlers. His power occasionally hurt. Teddy Long could not go one-on-one -on -one with The Undertaker. Eric Bischoff couldn't even go one-on-one -on -one with Teddy Long. And the less said about Vicky Guerrero's in-ring prowess, the better, which is why William Regal was such an enduring and wonderful figurehead of NXT for the eight, count them, eight years he was GM because his proclamations of matches, stipulations, and war games were always laced with the fact that if you disagreed with his ruling, then he'd bloody well give you a damn good hiding sunshine. There's a level of authenticity and respect there that no authority figure has ever had. And then you consider Commissioner Regal, the other side of the coin in terms of respect, but a beautifully performed portrayal of peak pomposity, replete with UK flag, foreign lackey, and piss-laced beverage, like we Brits like it. And now he's head dad of the Blackpool Combat Club and cutting really good promos with MJF. He's just the bloody best, isn't he? He's the bloody best, Tim. Eh, that's, I can't do a William Regan impression. Right, sunshine. He's a bloody...
no, I can't do it. And that's our list. What's your best William Regal impression? Write it in the comments. Don't forget to like and share this video around if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to Parts Fun Known for more silly wrestling content. And never forget to jam that jam. Thank you.